My birth name was Evangelina Lopez, and I was born in Alamo, Texas. I remember Alamo, uh, Texas a little bit, very little, but I remember, um, I must have been about three years or so, my uncle knew of a job that my dad could do, so he arranged it for him to move. So we moved to Visalia in around 1949 or so. I thought it was a very beautiful city. It was a clean and we went downtown and my dad kept working as a farm laborer until he got a job as a working in the railroad. So then we moved to little towns like Exeter. We lived in Layton. They kept moving him around whenever he had to go. My father was Jesus Lopez. He would come and go, and he seemed to be not too dedicated to his jobs or something. I just remember him leaving us, and then he'd come back, and then he'd leave again. And he, he would cook once in a while. That's one good thing I, I can say about him. And he was a good dad when he wasn't drinking. He had a little bit of a drinking problem. My mother was Isabel Pacheco. She always wanted us near. There was a lot of things we couldn't do, but we understand why she was having to be mother and father because my dad would leave. Uh, she always went to church and we always had to be there, like the first ones there and the last ones to leave. And then she would uh, make tamales on Saturdays because women used to make tamales to help pay for the uh, church. Cell was the oldest Sal was very intelligent. I, I just remember we all looked up to him. He cut on right away, he started school, and he was pretty smart. He'd always come with good grades, and he was always, he must have had a good teacher. Everybody liked him. And I can remember one time he was in a play, and he did very well. My mom was so pleased. Um, my mom and dad, I think my dad was there too, and he was very happy with him. And then there was me. <laughs> Can't say I was smart, but I liked school. And I, I, I did all right in school. I did pretty good. Then there was Joe. He seemed to have a little problem growing up. Uh, mischievous. <laughs> little, little things got into bigger things later on in life. But he struggled, I think. And, he was a joker. He used to let make us laugh all the time and when we had family gatherings. He was like the clown of the party. I mean, you know, a lot of people liked him because he, he liked to joke around. And then there was Juanita. She was pretty good. She always did what she was told and she did her homework and she pleased mom and Freddie him and Joe used to hang out together and uh, basically Freddie was a good kid. He, he was loving, he was caring and, and Irma, she was a baby and, and she was kind of attached to my mom at the most I guess because she was a little one, the youngest. She was always very pretty and they all told her she was very pretty and she she still is very pretty. <laughs> She's the only sister I have left now. My father's parents were Trinidad Magallanes and Francisco Lopez. I do remember vaguely 
I think while we were visiting my paternal grandparents, uh, they lived in a ranch. My grandfather came home, I guess he was a little bit tipsy, he came in a horse, and then there was shooting. And I remember my grandmother right away got on her knees and started praying her rosary. And uh, she told us, don't be afraid, everything's gonna be okay. But she was praying hard for him. I guess he must have had a drinking problem too, I don't know. My mother's parents were Refugio Castañeda and Jesucita Pacheco. Now my maternal grandparents, I don't remember too much. He used to knit and crochet and make baskets. He was very handy with his hands. And he would sell out at the market, the open, like flea markets, you know, that they had out there. I, and that's what he did for a living. He just made little products like that. And he made sweaters and shawls and bedspreads. And, and then he made baskets. And my grandmother had already died when I was born. So there was a stepmom, but I don't even remember. I was the oldest girl. And so my mother taught me at a very young age how to make tortillas. I was seven or eight years old. I had, we had to feed the family, you know, there's seven, six kids. My dad who came home hungry and the kids had to eat. So all I did was cook potatoes and make the tortillas. <laughs> That's all I knew how to do at eight years old. It was, uh, it, it was hard, it was rough living in that, um, in the section homes, they called them, the section homes were the, those were the homes they had for the employees. And they had uh, wooden stoves where you had to go out and get the wood and stick it in there, in the, in the little cubby and turn on the flame. And this was, I remember in Exeter, California, my mother had told me, well, if you can at least, you know, peel the potatoes and cook them and with a little bit of oil and then cover them. And, but I got scared and then I guess she must have told the neighbor to keep an eye on me. And so she came and she found me crying and she says, why are you crying? I said, that thing won't light up and I have to make tortillas and my dad's going to come and I'm going to be in trouble if I don't have dinner. <laughs> so anyway. She helped me and everything was fine. I don't know why. Here. It's okay. So many years ago. Yeah. yeah. But the memories are there. Yeah. Well, yeah, my mom, she suffered a lot with my dad. She could only do what she could do. And she went to the hospital with to have Freddy, and it was cold out there. And you had to go find uh, sticks for the fire. And, and you think, wow, you know, you, you're blessed. We're, we're so blessed, we don't know. You know, we think of those times and it's like kind of cloudy. <laughs> I saw my mom happy, you know, and and I was happy too. I didn't, I didn't know we were, you know, when I think of it now, I. I see it's, wow, how did I live through that? But, you know, when you're going through it, you're just afraid that your dad won't come in and yelling at you, <laughs> you know, cause he could be, you know, depends on the mood he was in. He could be real nice and he could be helpful, but imagine, I could just imagine as a child, he's gonna see, say, what did I do all day? Because I had time on my hands to, to do this and that, and why didn't I do it? Well, I was doing other things. I was trying to clean. I was trying to make that little baby bed look good when my mom came. 
It was like she was in the hospital like three days or so. I met Leland uh, when I was, oh, I guess I was a junior in high school. Yeah, as I was older, we moved back to Visalia from Exeter, you know. And by then, things were a little bit better. My dad had been gone for years already. He came to a conference with a group of, a trio. They had, he was in a trio, he was part of a trio. We always used to sit in the front <laughs> My mother saw that we sat in the front and the group needed a place to go change their clothes for the night service. And so when he came over, it was him and his two cousins. It was his cousins that came and told me, hey, Le Leland has his eyes on you. And I said, he does. And then, yeah, he wants to meet you. and. And so that's when I met him. They came over at my house. I didn't even know they were coming, but I met him there. And, and later on, I got a letter from him and we started writing. And then he wrote to me and asked me for a date by mail. And I told him graduation because that, that was more, um, that would be a, a more important date. So he did, he came out and we talked and we laughed and we compared notes of our upbringing and I didn't have to have a chaperone because I was old enough by then. <laughs> so we kept writing back and forth for another nine months or so and then, and then he asked a big question. Yeah, so when he asked me to marry him, I said, you know, the only thing that concerns me is how do I know that you're going to love me the rest of my life? And we can only get married once. <laughs> and so he says, why wouldn't I love you the rest of your life? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so we got married on June 20th, 1964, the following year after I graduated from high school. Michelle was born in October of 1965. To have that little bundle of joy just crying out. <laughs> and uh, she was a crybaby. <laughs> I remember the first night I couldn't even sleep. It was too much excitement and I wanted to be there, you know, whenever she made any kind of noise, I'd jump up. I'm a light sleeper anyway, so. Being her mom, she was a perfect child. <laughs> she, she was potty trained by the time she was 10 months old. <laughs> uh, she started talking early too. She liked little books. I'd take her to the library in the stroller and we would go visit the library and check the children's little, um, you know, the primary books, the thick ones. And she loved the pictures. And Glenn was born in September of 1967. Ever since he was born, he never fussed. He was at peace, he slept, and he, he was a good baby uh, during the night, and I didn't have to get up as many times as the first one. Maybe it was because it, she was my first one and I was so worried about her. And the second one, well, I already knew what was gonna happen and, and how to feed him and all that. So he was a pretty content baby. Growing up, he amused himself with little cars and, you know, he, he didn't need somebody else to play with, actually, he was, he was fine. Him and Michelle got along pretty good and, of course, she tried to be the little mother. She got candy because she thought he was hungry and she stuffed his mouth with candy. And she comes to me and she says, Mommy, baby hungry and I Somehow she told me that the baby, something about the baby, and I ran to see what happened. And his mouth was, he was like choking on some candy. 
I said, no, Mija, did you give him that? And she says, yes. And I said, oh, no. I said, you don't give baby candy. And I was so scared. I grabbed him and I petted him. All the candy came out. Thank God. <laughs> Tessie was born in August of 1972. Her sister and her brother kind of catered to her, and by then I think we were all just happy to have another baby in the family because it had been, you know, that many years, five years. With Tessie, yes, she she was choking on a piece of um, a Viewmaster, those little Viewmasters that you oh, click the and the yeah, the slide. And um, she was crawling, and she picked it up, and I guess she poked it, because I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how she had got it in her mouth, but she poked it with her little finger, and it came out, and she just put it in her mouth. And your grandpa was in the restroom, and I said, "Honey, hurry!" I said, "The baby's choking," and I couldn't get it out, and I didn't know what it was. Michelle grabbed her and went to the car with her dad. I said, I'll be calling the doctor emergency. And the doctor came in and checked her out and he says, oh, it doesn't show anything. And then they took more extras. They couldn't see it because the little slide was, you know, like a negative in the picture. I guess she coughed and the thing came out. To all my children, I would like for them to always, always um, listen to your parents. They've been around a lot more years than you have. I know it's hard when you become a teenager and you may think you know it all, but it's really listen to your parents and, and pray to God that he will direct your path. There's obstacles, but nothing is impossible. And, you ask the Lord and, and obey your parents. Basically, that I think that's the main thing, that you, lead, um, you be led by Christ and your parents who brought you into this world. <laughs>